for sing a day. Oh yeah, good um, find. Yeah. Oh, nice. It's a great find. Some sort of crystal down there. Yeah, check a quick sure. look if you can. Yeah, just yep. super quick. Pretty sure it's just a crazy gorgia. Okay, we're zoom in. We're seeing more stuff here. Yeah, getting predicted. somewhere. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yep, just a Chrysogorgia with a carniver, not carnivorous, coral, coral livers, mm -hmm. jelly on it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay, full wide. And Loopy, if you want, did you get the the sea star thing? Uh, no. Which one okay. were you looking at? If you go to Sea Stars and go to Sea Stars Other, should be under there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Sea Stars Other under Echinoderms. Under the what? Echinoderms. Oh God. Can't quite see from here. Man, I should have brought my glasses too. Ooh, no. another coral. Looks no. like maybe a bamboo coral to the left. To the left. Uh, stuff all over the place now. Yeah. yeah. Now we're really getting into it. Uh, I don't see the bamboo one. Oh, um, the, yellow the yellow one? Oh, okay. I thought I was looking for a more stick-like thing. Okay. Um, hold on, Sorry, I can't get low enough. Sorry, my vision is so bad that I can barely I direct you. <laughs> what are you looking for? The sea star? Yeah, just sea star's other, this tab. Um, oh, found it, found it, found it, found it. It's hard to get a good zoom. I'm right on a deck. But That's all um, good. That's fine. So, uh, zoom no in worries. there. Actually, that looks like, yep, looks like a bamboo coral. Awesome. Wow. Pretty. Yep. Or could be a black coral. Nope, pretty confident that that's a bamboo coral. Thank you. Okay. Full wide. dark in the distance yeah yeah it might be starting to go down slope again a little bit it after did. we've crested this ridge. yeah it is here yeah so yeah Cheyenne I'm not sure I want to bring the vehicles to, to uh, deeper depths okay so anything here you want to sample I would like to look for a rock sample but these look pretty smooth. There's nothing really loose. Mm -mm. Super smooth. There was a boulder you went over uh, half a minute ago. I don't know. I'll go back and take a peek. But I don't know. Do you want to stop the ship here because we don't want it to pull us uh, over the edge? Uh, bridge now. Oh, another um, bathy uh, Can we hold position here? On the right. Thank Come you. Me. Follow you. Sure. Yeah, let's try to explore this ridge if we can. Uh, we'll see how Atalanta swings. Some crazy in the distance. Ooh, is What's that this? a little fish? sediment patch? Or I think it's just sediment. Or just it? sediment? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Cool. Organism or sediment. It's a game now. Yeah, it's definitely sediment. Yeah, if you see something loose or something that you could pry off, uh, it would be a good place to try to grab it, but not too important.
maybe down in here. There's a. Uh, okay. Um, hallucinating. <laughs> it's that time of the night. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, does any of these look loose to you? No. Not that to me that I can, not that I, nothing I can see. Here. Maybe something back in here. Yeah. Those dark ones. Uh, I was going to say they might be shadows, but they don't look like shadows. They look like stuff you can pick up. Maybe. Yeah. 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 This guy? Yeah, one of those ones exactly. <coughs> yeah, let's go for it. And while it's still nighttime out here, many of you are viewing from the day side of our planet. Well, we got a lot of people from around the world. And I think we have a s open spot. Um, the two big ones are here. taken up in the That's starboard. You think that'll fit in the starboard side? Well, the two Is big the ones are no, full. Right. Would it fit in the sl smaller? I don't think so. Let's see what we got here. That's this little one right in front of the porch here, if that is a little one. Yeah. That might I kind of like this, one of these angular ones here. Yeah. Better. So uh, maybe the front uh, starboard side of the, the toolbox might be free. I'm not sure. Yeah. This one right next to the lasers looks pretty good to me. If you yeah. can read, I don't, it's hard to tell if that's loose though. Yeah, we'll see. Can you show me the bubble cam and the, or the arm and the bubble cam? Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is your favorite? Yeah, I like it, I think. No, kind of looks like a pillow. Oh, no. Oh, oh no way. <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty attached there. How about the one, like, right here? Yeah, there's some options. Yeah, that little one, yeah. All right, yeah, maybe just scratch around and see what is achievable. I like the little one, but I feel like it's attached. take another attempt at that, but I don't think so. <laughs> no. No, that's it's all the... Yep, it's in there. How about those right there? Just see if anything's loose, I guess. It's pretty... Oh, wow, no way. Well... It's all, uh, <laughs> yeah, how about it's that? It's all attached. <laughs> it's all pretty in there. These were the, these were promising, though, from I afar. Know. We tried. What yeah. about this? Oh, yeah. I'm on the far left one. No I feel way. like that is definitely <laughs> attached. That always happens to me whenever I'm going to pick up a rock I find interesting. <laughs> oh. Oh. Hey, oh. Nice. Hey. Got it. Oh. Cool. That'll fit in the side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Nice job. Yeah, so you Perfect. can just put it in. See Showcase. Your yeah, take a, let's get a snap yes. of it. Good sample. All right. Yeah. Uh, All good? Yep, we're good. Okay, sub's rocking around here. Uh, let me see if I can get that to behave before we play in the box. bit better. Okay, can we go sample salvo 
and uh, let's change the camera for the other starboard one and and all that. All right. Are you busy with Argus? Um, I can open that for you. And I need the other camera too. There's a starboard, uh, the the Niskin one. See anything else? We already got one of these with yellow, right? Niskin. Yep. I don't yeah. See so turn the port rail one off. And then the starboard bio box cam, I think. Yeah, it's really interesting to yeah. see the distribution. Yeah. There we go. Then box out. And which uh, which one is open? Yeah. Uh, small, a small one, but uh, what's I think taken? The, I think the two aft. I was say, yeah, we have C and D that's open. Is there anything in there that will come out? No, no, it's just rocks, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, C and D doesn't have anything in them. Okay. Uh, they were worried about something maybe floating out. Look, in in the toolbox like in the front, there we go. there's uh, yeah. Floaties. something that's going to float out, yeah. I think you're good here. Nice. Got it in... Is that C or D? That's C. C. Yeah. Okay, box in. Right. Cool. Got it. Let's take another look around here and see if there's a uh, Something else worthy yeah. of collection. Yep. That's good for the rock. And uh, mm -hmm. oh wow, we're up here now. Excellent. back the ship up a little bit so um, Atalanta doesn't get pulled too far ahead. Sure, yeah. Yeah, she does not want to turn your way. Uh, far away from me, I'll come back over to her. Yeah, so as we ascend, it looks like we'll be running into more cool things as we near the top. Oh, looks like there is some sort of fish down there, but yeah. Yeah, so Atalanta's gone well over the edge here. We were just holding it back. So, so uh -oh. <laughs> as I get closer, it's just it's going away catch again. Up. Which direction? So face west, because he's going to try and bring the ship okay. back west and he might sample there again. I'm just coming close enough to you so you can get turned around there. Okay. Mm, there. Yeah, so you're already, you're good. Yeah, I'll just turn around there. There we are.
So if you're just tuning into the chat, welcome aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. We are currently exploring an unknown guild, which is right outside the, excuse me, Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. I'm saying it all night, but still a mouthful. It is right within the exclusive economic zone of the United States. And this region is very interesting for its variety of geologic features as well as abundance of life that we have been seeing on this expedition. This region has also been nominated to potentially become a national marine sanctuary, so the mapping, exploration, and sea floor characterization we are performing will add valuable information to the database that can help inform that process. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Brian here. Uh, there'll be a watch change in a few minutes. I figured we could um, keep exploring this little ridge and not do another ship move until the next watch comes in. Sure. Do you want to do, uh, we, we already put one in in reverse, so to speak, to the west to keep us on this little plateau. Okay. Do you want to yeah. come back another one so they can mosey sure. around there or kind of went off the edge? Yeah, I think it's it's nice being on, on this ridge, but uh, it doesn't matter too, too much. The next okay. m next ship move, I think, is going to be back towards the sort of west northwest, right? Okay. To get us up the slope on this side, um, so wherever the ship needs to be to think about that next move. But uh, good watch, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dwight. So a lot of these together here, four. Yeah, really getting that meadow effect. Right, right. Video doing watch change. Dropping down a little. Good morning, Midwatch. Morning. Morning. Morning, Brian. Good morning. You're going to love all the crinoids and corals we've been seeing. I love me some good stocked crinoids. Yep. Yes. I was going to say, we have 20 samples coming in. We have up there. Do you mind? Can I take a peek at this real quick? Go ahead. Go Thanks. for it. Not seeing too much different here. Salvage so jog. Nice good morning as I pass this off to our next SPO leader, Katie, and you'll all have fun with her. Don't stay See you last. later. Oh, good, they got the push cores. Excellent, thank you. All right, everyone, we're just going into a watch change in advance, so we'll Another probably kind of hang out here Another holothurian smack dab in the middle. Kind of translucent. Oh, I smell delicious coffee. Who has that? <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to keep heading west? And now I take my No, leave. we're just going to wait for the watch Good change. Night, I'm just noodling around here. This one definitely kept me on my toes. What's your air heading? Just flipping around all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good one for you.
Might turn that thrust around and turn around. Got to wrap around right now. Yeah, I'll put the other one on for a minute if you need it. Just no. get it. Kind of keep it heading west right now. See ya. Facing west. Okay. Maybe we'll just pop up over the lip of the ridge, uh, Sarah, so that they're not. Uh, Hand it over in a better place. Okay, There you go, this even that's fine. That's Want me to wait till you pop over that ridge, or you're ready, Mike? What's that? Hmm? Who's speaking to me? Yeah, where where That's are you, the Dan? Voice of Dan? Like this is the voice of God right now. <laughs> the voice of God. He's down in the lounge or something, or he's, he's, he's got it wired. Is that the phone. level of <laughs> <laughs> level of ROV pilot? We don't need to need to be by the controls to command the ROVs. <laughs> He's just sitting in his rack with an Xbox controller. <laughs> <laughs> Still turning. Well, good morning, everyone. Another fun four hours. So I see that we're still in Crinoid silly City. There they are. Okay, off comms. Have a good watch, everyone. Thank you. So I don't know if it was because I was watching the Weird Al Yankovic movie on the way here, but I started trying to like, when I was should have been asleep, I was rethinking up words to silly songs like, we built this city on crinoids. That's where my brain was going at midnight. It's okay, Brian. One day you'll laugh. And it's going to be like a full belly chuckle laugh. Knee slapper. It'll probably be on the other half of our watch. Mornings <laughs> are not my thing. Yeah, I was going to say. I think he's still waking up. <laughs> so are y'all guys coffee drinkers? I am, but not for not for the normal reason. <laughs> I am I am one of those strange people who does not drink coffee or tea. There seems to be a high concentration of them on the boat. I would agree. That's this is the best of it. I'm used to be everyone thinking I'm a pariah because I don't. But on this cruise, we seem to have a fair number of people like that. But it seems like that every cruise. Like I remember last year, I went home and I was like, "Am I coffee shamed?" <laughs> Do I feel like I'm the pariah for drinking a ginormous amount of coffee every day? So I tried switching to like green tea and eating chocolate covered espresso beans to like, I don't know, be healthier, I guess. Horrible idea. No, no. Because in the afternoon when I would get my next group of like little 10 year olds or kindergartners or especially the high schoolers, um, it's a very lucky reason that I'm still alive and they're still alive. <laughs> I need the full caffeine. Chocolate and green tea alone does not cut it. So 
So as we are switching back over again, my dorky brain in the morning started looking up Bachery Idols. And Bacheri I found Idol, out, yeah. oh yeah, I was like, let's just Google search this. <laughs> so that means bunch of grapes. And then some other ones are reniform, which means kidney shaped and mammillary, so sp meaning breast shaped. Okay. I didn't do too much deeper digging than that because <laughs> that's about all my brain could handle. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Welcome to the 4 to 8 a.m. edition. <laughs> the greatest edition, the goats. I want it on two. Bath of Pathies. But you can hit the salvo and then do two. Bath of Pathies. Bath of Pathies. So hit the dive salvo. Here's a type of black coral. Dive salvo is the purple button all the way to your left. So that's a Bath of Pathy. Bath of Pathy. And it's the same one that we saw last. Not the same one, but same Please. species. Same genus. Same genus. I'll try it one more time. H1, two. There you Sweet go. Jesus, Corley. We already got your first. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Crinoid me a river. <laughs> Did you want to see the uh, bathy passes? Yeah, let's take a quick zoom on that. Go ahead, Derek. So whoever suggested crinoid me a river, tonight around midnight, I will be thinking up full lyrics for that. <laughs> All right, that's probably good from the science side. Okay, I can go ahead, thanks. All right, whenever you all are settled and ready to go, let's go uphill. Going uphill, right, all right. there. You ready to zag? Yeah. <clears throat> I haven't figured out where that is yet, but I can move the ship. Zero there. Yeah, I see it. Yep, thanks. Because that looks different than what I was seeing last night. That could be our first plexord of the day. Did you copy him in? Right. Hmm. Is that a sponge or a coral? It's though. a coral. And I'm not sure what type yet. Sorry, I'm just going back up a little bit. Oh, okay, now I see it better. Uh, go ahead, Daryl. No, it's a different color morph black coral. Oh, so another bathopathy? Um, no. I'm not 100% sure what it is. Can now uh, push in a bit more for him. But it's definitely an Anthopotherian or black coral. Um, but if you see, it's got mm -hmm. secondary branching out on its um, mm -hmm. axial arms, which uh, makes it not a bath of athies. It's not quite focused there, though. I'm going to have to key this one out unless there is a black coral expert somewhere out there on the internet listening. They probably are. Be All prepared, right. Brian. You just open the floodgates. Good. Makes my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> Crowdsourcing. All right, Dan, I think we're good back here. Thanks. Okay, you can go ahead. Thanks. And so the scientific name for a black coral is an antipatharian? Yep. Cool. Trying to get some of my coral names down. Hmm. 
Uh, somebody said that that's going to be a staropathies. 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 Zoom on him as we go by. Nice little cluster of black corals here. This looks like a bath of pathies again. Okay. Bring our head to the left a little for us. So as we're moving up this ridge, is there a current that we are fighting against or a current that's helping push us, like a drift dive? And I know that's a hard question to answer. Um, I can see which way the... Uh, which way the current's blowing, so we're definitely going against it. This looks like a primnoid. Might be the first one of the dive. I don't know if they saw one last watch, but we certainly, I don't I think we saw one on no. last on the PM edition of the 4 to 8. Yeah. Yep, that's definitely a primnoid of some type. If I had to venture a guess, I'd say a Canadella or an Arella. Can we get a little bit tighter on some of the polyps? Yeah, go ahead. Good. We'll zoom there. Got a couple little opioid associates there, hanging on. Oh. Full zoom. What, do, what do you call these, o opioid? Yeah, brittle stars. Oh, okay. Opioids. I was going to say, these Science look like happy. teeny tiny. <laughs> okay, I know, I was thinking the same push. thing. I was like, Brian's got really good eyes. What am I not seeing? <laughs> Disruptor up. And so somebody online who's been watching for a bit is saying that that was the first primnoid that they have seen so far this dive. The last watch didn't see any, or the last watch saw something, but they didn't get a good zoom in. Lots of little black corals here. Looks like there's probably are more staropathies here. So do we know what gives these deep sea corals their color? Because they don't have the zoxanthellae like they would have up at the surface. Yeah, it, it's pigment. Like it, I don't know. I don't know the actual biochemistry of what type of mm -hmm. coloration or whatever. But it's, um, you know, the coral grows it just like other animals have different coloration in their tissues. Okay. And it can be it can be very misleading when it comes to identifying organisms um, in the deep sea. That's what you were saying. Like even though it's the same species, it could have two different variations probably different species but certainly different genus uh, genera have um, very different colorations sometimes like we think of the the purple pu bubble gum corals that look the texture and color of bubble gum also come in a white flavor um, that really you get you get a search image going for these pretty purple co corals or pink corals and then suddenly you see a white one and it really throws you off But a lot of times, color is a very relative thing in water. Um, you know, there are there are some organisms that are definitely one color or another. There's a Brasingid sea star that's got missing a few arms. Looks like somebody snacked on it at some point. 
I mean, you can also see they're starting to regrow the arms there mm -hmm. on the top. Um, but yeah, as a general rule, color uh, when identifying corals and even fish um, can be a really poor indicator. Fish scales are strange and they change colors depending on the light you see them with. Squid and octopi can just change colors like chameleons. And corals come in many different shades, even within the same taxon. Now there's another sea star in the bottom on the right. Um, so we're, some, we're getting into the sea star kind of much more so. Speaking of light. Yep. You're quick with them there, Daryl. Is the sea star allowed to have as many legs as it wants? Most of them have five, and most of them have some kind of repeating pattern multiple of five, but those aren't hard rules. Um, but like the Brasengids certainly have a lot more. Um, oh, okay. Five. We generally think of sea stars and echinoderms broadly having pentaradial symmetry, mm -hmm. but that's really a gross generalization, and there are plenty of exceptions to the rule. So we have a question from the van, or for the van. What is the coolest thing that we have seen so far this expedition? My favorite is still the ginormous protist from yesterday. Which, by the way, you can check out on YouTube uh, or the NautilusLive.org websites under the gallery. Yeah, that would be mine as well. Chris, do you have a different one, or is that your favorite? Oh, that's got to be mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Corley, is that it the Bottery one. Idols? That's no, different. I see those all the time. It definitely Look was the that. mysterious orb. <laughs> Daryl, what do you think? The shark was pretty cool as well. Ooh, the shark's a good one. Oh, look at that. Okay, can push right, in there. So it's Chrysogorgia down on the left, the bottom left of this rock. It's a lot of brittle stars. And it's a lot of brittle stars on it, something. <sighs> I'm really not sure what something is. You can push in tighter there. In the oh, it's one of those tricky ones. This is a Chrysogorgia being overgrown by zoanthids. So we've got a parasitic zoanthid here overgrowing the underlying um, Chrysogorgia. So there's two different uh, species here of coral in air quotes. And then you got a big astroschema um, snake star sitting here in the dead center. Is a zoanthid a, is a coral? Mm, I had not looked that up, the taxonomy of that up. So what Dr. Google is saying is, yes, yes it is. Thank you, Dr. Google. <laughs> <laughs> All right, science is happy. Thank you. Okay. Pick so you said that up. is a snake star. I've never heard of that terminology. Sorry, it's yeah, kind of my it's sonar here. Astroschema? Astroschema. Lynette, what's been your favorite thing that you've seen so far this expedition? Uh, I mean, I'm team alien for sure. <laughs> um, also, the swimming uh, sea cucumber was pretty awesome. The one oh, from last night? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of hypnotic. Cool to watch. That's a good one. 
Dan, any fan or any faves? Yeah, my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> the jaded old sailor. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Take a quick peek at the sponge piece. Sure. So, Ren, what's your favorite so far? I really like that sea cucumber thing we saw last watch, or my last watch. Oh, the one, uh, the clear one that Lynette was saying? The swimming one? Yeah, that one kind of resembled the headless chicken monster a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool. You can uh, zoom in there, please. So this looks like probably a bolosoma, which is a type of euplectellid glass sponge. All right, that's good, thank you. Okay, I can go away. So, are those... Also um, could be Halostaris. Are those ripples uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical? Like, can you tell? Sand ripples. Look pretty symmetrical to me. So that means they're wave action and not current? Uh, it, could be cur it could still be current, but it would be um, pretty consistent current from the same direction. And uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. One of the U8 scientists studying the ripples down here. If they were uh, all piled up, if they were asymmetrical, it was current. If they were symmetrical, he, oh, I forget now. <coughs> I get it backwards all the time. As the biologist who's playing a geologist back here, I will certainly defer. <laughs> <laughs> so one was from wave action, and uh, one was from current. So I'll have to go digging I'll have to go look that up. I was surprised to hear about wave action at like two thousand meters, but Yeah, you can get internal waves down here breaking. Yeah. Crazy. Interesting. I never would have thought that. Forever ruined about looking at ripples in the sand now. <laughs> we take a look at the coral in the top. Uh, right, please. Okay, Daryl, push in there. And this would be a bamboo coral. Yep, good, definitely good, good banding there. That's good for us, thank you. Okay. Starboard side. Okay. Yeah, you need to come up. I will come up that way and get under you. So, Chris, since you are the manager of Palmyra, uh, atoll where we're just north of is this something that you are fascinated to see just because it's like wow that's been just north of me under my under my feet for forever no it's definitely fascinating to see and the since palmyra is so remote Pushing a bit there Darryl, so we'll come into the deep ocean mm -hmm. uh, it's a very big topic of conversation of what else lies down there that's good thanks Right. It's like a crinoid on a sponge. Yep, crinoid and a squat lobster sitting on top of a sponge. It's it looks like a vase of flower, a vase with a flower in it. Yeah. 
That's a little coral in the background. I can't tell. That looks like another one of those star pathies. Black corals we've been seeing. Should have time to uh, push in there on the little squatty on the sponge. Zoom in a bit there for us. So my assumption is this is an in inunima, inunima uh, squat lobster, which is a little bit different than the chrysostylids we've been seeing. Hiding under the branches of this comatulid crinoid. And we've got a shrimp here as well. Chris, can you pull up Mary Wickstein's um, wish list? Both of them actually. That just looks so pretty. It also makes me wonder about the little gecko that we have. Can we take a look, close look at the sponge? Uh, excuse me, the shrimp that's hiding on the sponge. Sure. He's hiding from the lobster, is he? <laughs> in a bit there for us to Okay, you can go tight. Oh, wow. Do you think you get the slurp nozzle in there? Yeah. Well, let's try and, let's try and slurp that one. One of the taxonomies you work with. Mary Wicks changed to ours. Change cameras to, uh, to the dark. Better describe the taxonomy of these um, shrimp and has requested shrimp that look like this um, to better understand the taxonomy of the group. So, on the first day we were steaming out of Honolulu, um, somebody found a little gecko on board. So, Samantha took it and trying to be sweet, put it on like a, some little plants that we have growing in our cabin. And then she even took a banana and like set it down next to the it's plants It's on your banana. hotel cameras. Hotel cam, oh, you're pushing buttons up there. Yeah, hotel cameras bucket. So put the little banana down next to it, hoping and to attract fruit flies. should have uh, changed oh. to the flush jar there, so you're gonna have to move to the flush jar. I have not seen that little guy since, so I'm <laughs> hoping he's okay. But animals don't tend to do too good out at sea. Yeah, the flush jar is all the way in the back there. Jar <sighs> one. Uh, flush jar, I mean, all the way around. Can you uh, move the boat back to the south? Bridge nav. Can we move two zero meters south, please? Thank you. I'm not seeing the flush jar yet. You're having trouble there. Right there. Okay, turn on the uh, slurp and uh, flush it out.
Right it. Go wide for a start. We're going to have to come off and I'll come back here. Is your uh, flush still on? Did you turn T4 back off? Turn it off, please. You got me by the tail. So while we're maneuvering around, I have a fabulous dad joke for you. And I know you're very excited. But why are there some fish at the bottom of the ocean? They dropped out of school. So he's, he's looking, uh, let's see, he's looking west, you move east, yeah, you could move east a little, but in theory that is parallel to the ridge, right? If you move east, in theory that's parallel to the, uh, in theory. Yeah, that's fine. You could do an east move. Ooh, we had a little cusky old come up into Atalanta's feed. There it is. Okay, I'm 
going to, while we're waiting for the boat, get the uh, slurp gun out here. Do you think deep sea creatures have their own type of circadian rhythm? The way that we have like, it's daylight, we wake up, it's nighttime, we go to sleep. Do you think that they might have something like that at the deep sea? It's very possible. You actually still get tidal effects down here. And so, so the current flows and you get waves breaking and stuff like that on the seamounts based on uh, tidal flows, even though you don't see much tidal range out here per se, or it's almost imperceptible uh, at the surface, it does cause movement all the way down the water column. So I doubt it would be based on a lunar, a solar day, but there could definitely be something based on a, um, a, uh, a lunar day and or just seasonal changes have a, some kind of circadian rhythm on the order of months or weeks, potentially based on other kind of processes that they can feel that we're, it's hard for us to see or document. But that might be something that it's going to take us a while before we can fully flesh out, understand, Close research. The box, yeah, I mean, we're getting to the point where, you know, we, we're happy when a CMAT has one or two ROV visits thinking about and documenting long-term changes in behavior and stuff like that with monitoring. There are only a handful of locations uh, in the world that have deep sea kind of monitoring equipment, real-time monitoring equipment, the cabled observatories, uh, Ocean Airways Canada, mm -hmm. Neptune, Pioneer Array, things like that. Um, are starting to be able to, you know, look at the behavior associated with long-term changes, but, you know, there's less than a dozen sites globally, probably less than 10, um, that kind of are capable of doing those kind of observations for over long periods of time. And we're certainly, at an ephemeral ROV visit of come down, check out one spot, move through, cover a couple kilometers, and move on, uh, you know, 50 miles away, is certainly not going to capture that kind of um, detailed in detail intricacy. Yeah. It's one of the things I think we need to do it from a technological development standpoint is figure out better ways to put um, Long -term. Deep, deeper and cheaper monitoring s sites out here that don't require mobilizing a full expedition to get the data back. So if we dropped a... Uh, uh, temperature and current logger here we'll see if um, I can at get the expense there. of thirty to fifty oh, thousand dollars a day of ROV time swinging. to drop it off. Um, after steaming four straight days down here and four straight days back to yeah, yeah. if I want to come back and collect my data in six months, I gotta mobilize an entire other expedition um, at great cost. And so trying to figure out better ways, sensor packages and stuff that can um, phone home the data after a deployment would go a long way in, in helping us kind of start asking those kind of questions. So I got to be on the Ocean Networks Canada cruise a couple of years ago, and that was so completely mind-blowing to see the advancements in technology, the systems that they have in place to do what you were saying, the long-term monitoring. But I definitely know it was not cheap, mm. and it was so dependent upon taking a research vessel out there once every six months, once every year to collect try, most of the um, data. See. And service all those uh, nodes and everything. Away from the cliff. <laughs> yeah. He's looking west. The cliff is behind us. You're going to try moving to the south a little bit more. That was the whole expedition. <laughs> Plugging and unplugging. So whenever you want to feel nostalgic about it, you go down to Home Depot and What's you that? plug and unplug some stuff. Uh, sure. Sorry, Brian, the Argus altitude there is... Just a little uh, right on the. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize not this was teens a there, and I can't quite get enough slack to yeah, get in there. Yeah, did not realize that we were in a, a rough spot when I asked for it. Those uh, big heaves there, taking it mm. into single digits. So. So when we get done with this. Um, Waypoint 3 Prime on high pack is 
is not particularly important, just upslope is the direction. So if you want to put us on this little ridge back and just follow the terrain upslope, that's totally fine with me. The three prime is, is a guideline. So whatever makes your life easier um, from the navigation RV control is fine with me as long as we're headed up towards the summit. Your uh, auto heading on looking uh, west of you. Burn it. Okay, you can hold that heading. Uh, give me the most slack here. So the shrimp, we kind of got to sneak up on them when they sense the, uh, the suction, the water moving. No, I don't know about this particular kind, but they'll run away. Well, it's kind of a timing. You can sometimes get them to run into the slurp, but they're pretty clever with the. Uh, seem to know we're coming after them. Kind of like my chickens when I'm trying to catch them. They know. Or cats. So you can uh, switch to uh, whatever jar is open there. Run and the data will know, back row will know. Um, that one's good. What jars do we have the fine mesh in, do you guys? I don't think we need fine mesh for shrimp. Yeah, save those, please. So three, four, five, six, seven, all good. Seven works for me. Uh, yeah. Leela's not here. She would be very particular about going in order. <laughs> You're going to hear about it later. Yeah, no, she'll be very particular later. Yeah. <laughs> play now, pay later. Let's see if I can get hurt just to stop dancing around there. scary at night. As long as it doesn't bounce off the rocks, we're good. Well, I'm going to try and uh, do something about this. But, uh, Disrupt the vis a little bit. Maybe it will stop the wiggling there. Mm -hmm.
sees you coming. What's up? Uh, go tight there, Daryl. Two of them in here and there. Yeah, they've already. They, sh they look the same to me, so either are fine. Sink, is it? Just teasing you there. <laughs> this reminds me of like a squirrel rolling around the tree. Like yep. you try to see the squirrel and he's like, no. I'm on the other side Go already. Go <laughs> See the uh, sea star before. Yeah, there's that super Monte pink Cat. sea star, and then there's something else just off the frame to the right that I, I'm having trouble telling what it is in the um, in the other cameras. That before we depart, I'd like to take a quick look at. But So close. Okay, and there's three of them in there. You ready on the suction? So, so you're gonna click it right up to 100 when we you push in there a bit, Daryl. That's good. Okay, go for it. Fingers crossed. Is that 100? Oh, come on. Almost. I can never get these guys. <laughs> There's one. Yay! There's one. Oh, oh. One's all you get. Yep, that's fine with me. Thank you so much. Great job. We'll see these in the dark. What sample number there is that? There we go. There yeah, he is. Okay. All right, um, there it stop is. Stop suction and rotate back to flesh. Sample. 026. 26? Yep. All right, sample 26 is a shrimp off a hexactinol sponge uh, that we believe was one of Mary Wixton's sample of opportunity requests. All right, okay. So how does a scientist ashore tell us what, or make a request to the Nautilus or any exploration boat that, hey, we really want this sample. There's a form. <laughs> Simple as that. Fill out a form, send us scope pictures of what you want or description, and uh, we keep a log over here. The data logger keeps a log of the request for the expedition, and I try and memorize as much as I can. Um, 
on the way so that I kind of have a, a search image of what I'm looking for and then we'll look it up. Okay. You know, it was really strange. I had the button. I should have not done that, and it did anyways. <clears throat> Once yeah. you get situated, before we depart, if we could zoom on the pink sea star to your right, and then something a little bit further to your right that I couldn't tell what it was. Right. It. That guy right here? Yep. Just blew off the rock. Oh. Yep, that one. <laughs> you want to see both sides of it, right? Yeah, that's actually really <laughs> pretty useful because we don't usually see their their oral disc side, oral side that often. Go ahead, Daryl. I can zoom in there. Oh. God, I'm blanking can out. I what is go it? for a tight zoom. The ampullar and the ampullar groove. Yeah, this is definitely the first time we've seen this one on this dive. And it looks like it's got an associate crawling around on it. I can't tell what it is yet, but something is living on it. All right, that's probably good for me. We can go look at the what I think might be a new type of sea lily before we depart. Okay, you can go ahead there. There was a sea lily. It was to the right Further there. Further to the right, yep. Kind of on that little mid-screen. Should be just off frame right there. And it camera back up for us. Thank you. Okay, now you can zoom in there, please. Hmm. Whoa, Scotty in there is there too. an associate on this one? Uh, there is, more. and I'm beginning to think I was wrong. That is not. Um, what is that? A big that old squat is, lobster? Um, Bullapathies. So that left another bullapathies, kind of dead center. Corlin, I feel like we've kind of shifted rock types here. Again, does this look? Um, is now like sheet basalts more than pillow basalts, or? Um. um Kind of hard to tell, but I don't know. Some of like down here, down to the bottom right corner, looks a little lobey to me still. Okay. I think a lot of this stuff looks kind of broken up a little bit, but then crusted over. Hmm. So what uh, is the geological formation or what causes pillow lava versus sheet lava? Um, it's really just a difference in uh, the flow regime. So it's more of like, I think, a mechanical. I think there's been studies that tried to figure out if there's chemical differences, but that's really not what it is. It's kind of dependent a little bit on viscosity of the magma or of the lava. Um, yeah, I think it has to do more with like the internal lava structure that kind of dictates that. Now I know each volcano or each hot spot has its own chemical composition. 
-hmm. Is that true of viscosity as well? Um, so... I want to see if she can do uh, three, four, five. There's a couple things that can affect viscosity. Yeah, um, mostly it is the chemical composition. So for basalt, yeah, for we'll, instance, uh, has a pretty low viscosity compared to like a rhyolite, um, Push in there, which yep. rhyolite are the kind of big explosive volcanoes that we think about. What you think about? Volcanism. Oh, no, that is very cute. Over the hump, but. He's not swimming, or it's not swimming. A little tighter. Good, perfect. Thanks. What is that? <laughs> Another little uh, sea cucumber. Oh. Ascending intestine, descending intestine. All right. down a couple more meters. So Lynette, do you like this guy, this friend better or the friend from last night? Um, I mean, they look like cousins probably, eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, but definitely away. the swimming was pretty cool. I'm with you there. I think the swimming one was so neat. All right. Let's see if we can get uh, some negative delta here. So biology question, yeah. the top of the ocean is extremely noisy, especially around coral reefs, so much sound. Is there, do we know if there's a lot of sound down here at the bottom of the seafloor? There certainly is sound, unquestionably. Um, how much sound is a good question. And uh, they've definitely put hydrophones down here um, and it's, and it, I'm sure it changes at different frequencies. Um, but remember, sound transfers really well through the water. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get noises from far, far away. Um, that That's probably our first aridogorgia there. Um, and um, th so, Quick but zoom. one of the things that Quick is, zoom. I guess, problematic about the way we um, explore is our vehicles are quite loud. Um, so while it's a, you know, there's certainly noise, but it's probably quieter than a busy, is that a jellyfish on it? Uh, no, I don't know what it is, but it's it's too big to be one of the, the jellies I'm looking for. Okay, can go um, But like no, zoom back in anyway. the hydraulic power units and everything um, on here are are quite loud, and so we're we're probably scaring off um, a lot of mobile organisms down here by how loud and bright the vehicles are. So this is probably. Okay, a baby away. anthemastis just getting started is my guess on that one. Is an anthemastid a cup coral or a sea anemone? Nope, it's a mushroom coral. Oh, okay. And normally they have multiple polyps, but I'm thinking that's probably just a little baby that only has one polyp so far. like another umbulopathies here. Kind of interesting convergent evolution when you think about the metallogorgia, the umbulula and the umbulopathies and yeah. most of the Take stalked of crinoids enough. all have grown to be a somewhat similar um, um, kind of shape with the stalk and fan shape. Dan, I know you are way stretched out, but if, can you give me a zoom on that? Sure, go ahead. The bottom one here? No, the uh, it's off frame, top right. Now, it's a it's a real reach. 
I don't think we can get that. This guy here? Yep, that one. Can we go ahead? I Let's think go. this is new for the dive. Looks like we are getting into the realm of yeah, I'm either the it. Plexorid or Acanthagorgias. <laughs> and they are very hard to tell apart. Come down four meters. Ooh. Four meters. I think Plexorid with its polyps out, but it could easily be convinced by someone on the internet to tell me it's an Acanthagorgia. All right, that's all I need to get a to key it out later. I get one stable shot here. Oh, now I'm now I'm leaning more towards Acanthagorgia. Oh, you can just, you can just load crazy. Acanthagorgia or Plexorid. <laughs> All right, thanks, Dan. Okay. I got it. Yep. <coughs> Scoot. Scoot. <laughs> Those anthemastis are beautiful. Yeah, you do. Tail to tail, man. And somebody online is saying that the anthemastis okay, has now been renamed Heteropolypus. I do believe it. Taxonomist making my life harder with yeah. renaming things. <laughs> I'll start referring to it as the coral formerly known as Anthemastus. Put your uh, <laughs> auto heading on there. For Can me? you give it a symbol too? <laughs> right here. I'm watching your altitude and your sonar there. It's gonna. Uh, we should start moving you towards me there. Look at Lynette doing trigonometry over there. <laughs> She's doing fancy math now. So for those of you who weren't with us last night, the sea state in terms of um, waves isn't all that bad, but the force vectors the ship's having to deal with in terms of where the currents and the winds are versus where we want to move uh, is not lining up well with the main propellers on the ship. So we're a little bit limited in the direction of motion we can make on the seafloor. Uh, can we zoom purple left? Yeah. Um, and... Um, Go ahead, Daryl. So that's why we're having a little bit trouble maintaining this top of this ridge line because uh, the ship on. doesn't have the thruster power to go broadside, move perfectly. Uh, Authority ships are broadside. Yeah, see it. Yep, so this is another, pretty sure this is a Paragorgia. This is the second one of these we've seen so far. And it's got it. It's got its single br brittle star associate there. All right, that's good for me. Thank you. Okay, I can go in. Full light is it? Yeah. That's no, better, thanks. Okay, you can come up a bit now. So spike coming at you there. Lynette, would you be able to tell us a little years. bit about what it takes to be a navigator? I know you were just doing some trigonometry down there. Um, sure, yeah. Um, so um, our role as navigators kind of starts out uh, with multi-beam mapping um, and creating um, as high really resolution maps as possible of the area that we're planning to dive. Um, 
And then uh, we work with the mapping coordinator, the expedition leaders, the scientists to put together a dive plan, um, essentially laying down waypoints on a ridge of a seamount uh, that we'd like to explore. Um, and then um, we, when we're actually doing the dive, we work on getting the ship into the position necessary so that Hercules can explore uh, what we want to explore. Um, yeah, so Hercules is able to move on its own in XY space, uh, forward and back. Um, but Hercules is tethered to Atalanta, which does not have that ability and goes Carso. wherever the ship goes. <laughs> um, so in order to get Hercules where okay. uh, we need it, we need to get Atalanta um, in a good position. So that's kind of our role as the navigator. Um, and we're constantly looking at the weather, at the waves, at the current, um, to make sure that we can make those moves safely. So, yeah. So what is the trigonometry that you have to do? Is that how to figure out where to position the ship? <laughs> Driving Atalanta from 2,000 meters away. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so there's, um, what, 2,000 meters of cable in the water, uh, which takes some time to get moving. Um, yeah, so we have to have to think about that um, and sort of the delayed reaction that we'll see um, underwater. Um, yeah, and the trigonometry, it's really just, uh, we're looking at ranges and bearings and um, where we need to move the ship to explore what we want. Turn in. Yeah, I'm going to turn and burn along the cliff here and get Awesome. Up. Thank you so I'm much, Luna. Of course. Oh, little, little eel. Cusk eel. Cusk eel, yeah. Mm, I'm coming under you now. Yeah, it's really amazing how much of navigation, no matter what type of navigation you're doing, does come down to trigonometry. Mm -hmm. Like ships, airplanes, ROVs, it's all a lot of trigonometry. Not particularly complicated trigonometry, but. That's yeah. good though. I really thought once I took trigonometry, I'd never need it again. No, that, that is the, the math I use the most. Really? Yeah. I was doing an analysis um, and I was using acoustic Doppler current profiler data um, to understand this, the currents around a seamount. And I literally pulled out a high school trigonometry book um, when I was writing the code to process the data to make sure I got kind of the formulas right. But it was just basic high school trigonometry, arc sine, arc cosine, things like that. To, um, um, you need to come turn on both thrusters. Um, Turn on both thrusters and do a clockwise spin. So that's an Aritagorgia on the right, and I'm struggling with the two in the center. One on the right is probably some type of Chrysogorgid, and the one on the left is probably an Acanthogorgid. Spin all the way around, yeah. Take those two till they're up. So all right. octocorals? Yep, all octocorals. Right it. So it seems like we're starting to see a little bit more coral and life down here besides just the crinoids. Yeah, and it looks like we're also transitioning into um, kind of a different depth zone of corals here. We're picking up. Uh, different Chrysogorgias and the Eritogorgias. We picked up okay, um, right. this yellow coral, which is either an Acanthogorgia right. or a uh, Plexorid. Um, so we seem to have hit a little bit of a transition line here, right about 2,060 meters. I started, we started seeing these a few meters ago, so more like 2,075 meters. And you said that last yep. watch, I Keep believe. Spinning around. Take those turns That's up. around the the depth that we really start seeing corals again. Yeah, there's a lot of times there seems to be kind of a 
a break point somewhere between 2,000 and 2,400. Literally, literally 18 and like 2,400 meters seems to kind of be a special peak for corals. And then again at like right around okay. you know, 800 to 1,200 meters or so, plus or minus 200 Come meters, depending on exactly spinning. where you are. Makes sense. So yeah. I think we have a geologist oh. listening. Sure. Yep, I want it tight while you spin around there. So talking about the lava flows, they were saying the Reynolds number is the primary driving force behind lava flow characteristics. Within that, there's numerous variables that can be altered to change between laminar and turbulent and mixed flow regimes, and that the viscosity can vary throughout an er eruption. Mm-hmm. That is correct. Um, no, that's good. You can hold a north head in there. I'm definitely not a geologist, so <laughs> all that I was like, yep, yeah, that's um, those are big words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll get it back in the box here. <laughs> okay, you can hold the north heading and uh, turn off that. Ground fault interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. That does, yeah. Uh, should document that bug and uh, do a little write up on it. Video, can you iris a bit, please? Thank you. So we got a black coral on the right. Looks like a bamboo whip in the center. And not sure on the two on the left yet. And let's see. Just hold on one second. Quick zoom there, video. Yeah, that's good, thanks. Uh, that here we go it. with the overgrowing. So these are paragorges being overgrown by a zoanthid, both of them. Okay, go ahead, uh, come up. Sorry, we're gonna yeah, I'm get yourself just happy. Just a little close there, and I gotta come up. Another Brasingid sea star. Okay, should be good for the moment there. Something big. It's always fun when you see the shadows coming in, and you know something's about to good size is about to come into frame. It's a good size uh, bamboo coral. Looks like we might have a coral yeah, formerly known as anthemastus over here on the right with the bathypathies next to it. Let's come up, we'll both come up slow. Nice and slow, man. A little fast, try and hold it to 10 meters a minute. I'm not coming up faster, so if you come up faster, you can pull me and we will miss uh, some opportunities here on the wall. for now. Yeah. Good delta when I'm right under it. Let's 
So one of the things, one of the many things that makes deep sea science um, a little bit harder is our lack of understanding of the taxonomy. As you'll hear me crack jokes about taxonomists making my life harder and whatnot, but it really is something we need a lot more effort in, is understanding what is a unique species, what is just kind of morphological differences between different organisms, uh, and getting those kind of basic understandings. We have a pretty good understanding in, in terrestrial and shallow water communities. Um, if you ignore crypto spe cryptic speciation and stuff like that, we've got a relatively well-described sense of taxonomy, but down here it's very fluid and changes a lot. Uh, and we have, you know, groups of organisms that we just refer to by clade numbers and things like that because we're not sure how the taxonomy actually shakes out. So for someone like me doing trying to do ecological research uh, on broader scale patterns of biodiversity in the deep sea across potentially you know dozens to hundreds of taxa simultaneously, it, it can be very frustrating. Doing things at the species level is particularly hard. I generally work at the genus level um, just because I have a little more confidence in the taxonomy there. Um, but it is, it, you know, there are many, many careers worth of descriptions and whatnot for taxonomists here to better understand the exact relationships. Um, this, I think, is new. If we have time, can we look at that? That might be a Victor Gorgia. If it is, it'll be the first one. Yep, yeah. agreed. So it really feels like we're shifting kind of the coral communities here um, into a, a, a different kind of depth zone of what we're seeing. I'm pretty sure this is going to be a Victor Gorgia. Push in a bit there. One of the few um, purple branching corals. Yep, definitely going to go with Victor Gorgia on that one. Push in just a bit more. It looks like we've also got a new anemone um, showing up here. These are one of my favorite corals. Yeah, mine too. Must be above 2,000. Yep, Close. just about. What was the name of this guy? This is a Victor Gorgia. Vic. Cool. All right, I'm good. Okay, well, let's do a polyp zoom while we're here. Go ahead. You can uh, full zoom that. That's a pretty shot. Still floating, but okay. You can go away. Thank you. So, is there a way that you can quickly identify a sea anemone versus a cup coral? Uh, when I'm looking at them, they seem very similar, other than the maybe base. So just you'll the base. see the cup corals generally get narrow and have a triangular kind of shape that have a very discreet base. Um, up five anemones are going to be more so. cylindrical with a big fat foot holding on to the bottom. Anemones are motile; they can move. Uh, cup corals are welded into the seafloor. Awesome! Thank you. Uh, and when cup corals when cup corals retract almost all their tissue disappears and you just see kind of the calc the, the hard skeleton when um, anemones retract you end up with just kind of a purple blob <laughs> fleshy purple blob yeah i think you're already going exactly where i want you to go quick zoom there please uh yellow one or the pink one pink one right. the one you're on yep so this is uh looks like an umbelulopathies again it's a black coral with a shrimp associate with a little baby crinoid right next to it. But this is the, a bit more. this has been the dive of stalked organisms. Well.
So is there any kind of hard theory about why 2,000 meters above is where we start seeing so many coral species, and then when we get below that, it sort of kind of tapers out? I don't think so. Um, I mean, below 2,500 meters, 2,400 meters, the, the corals definitely become thinner and thinner um, all the way down to where they really vanish between five and 6,000 meters. Um, but I don't know. It's probably one of those. It's, I'm sure it's a, a combination of food availability and just some of what we were talking about yesterday with the biochemistry um, of trying to just make biochemistry work under this much pressure. A quick zoom on here. just quickly doing a back of the envelope calculation, we're approaching 3,000 um, PSI down here. Um, that's okay. another Go away. Wow. coral with an overgrowing zoanthid, probably a paragorgid. That could have been a scriptia, but I think it was a paragorgid. So 3,000 PSI is the same force of your standard pressure washer. 210 bar for those. Not from around here. Yeah, that's the one SI unit I really haven't picked up as bars. I just still think in PSI. Yeah, me too. Well, both actually. But when I'm diving internationally and get a, a gauge with bars on it, I have to really make myself think. I don't yeah, know why. It should be super simple. Too. But can push in there a bit, please. Another yeah. cute little Victorgia with what might be an Aplicophrin down there at the bottom on the set on the ground next to it. Those are actually coral predators. So that it's a type of mollusk worm. And push um, in on the worm might there. be going to end up crawling up and eating this um, coral a little bit. The swarm, is he, or is it a polychaete? It's a mollusk, actually. Oh, mollusk, mollusk. So related to, like, snails and slugs. Yep. Little amphipod there on the left as well. Lighter color, Victor Gorge. It's, it's amazing when you actually collect these okay. and put no them way. in alcohol, the pigment comes out and turns the alcohol that color purple, and the coral gets to be very pale and kind of white uh, in storage. So if you look at a preserve sample in a museum, they lose almost all of their pretty purple color. Come up uh, by nice and easy for us. That's always a hard thing for me to have to uh, explain to children. Like we have so many specimens like batfish and Pompeii worms and how they all lose their color once you, you or typically always lose their color once you put them in a uh, preservative. Really guys, it's so much prettier underwater. That is a black coral. Um, it's not a, sea, not a sea lily, I was wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's an Ambulopathies which is another one of the black corals. So we're definitely in like black coral diversity section here. This is the third or fourth um, type of black coral we've seen in this dive with a squat lobster almost as big as it is hanging out. But yeah, I think this is a new observation for this dive. Pretty shot. Can I uh, try it a little tighter there if you want, since we finally got it? Yeah. I'll take a second and do a beauty shot here. Mm. So the question is, what's more beautiful, the squat lobster or the ambulopathy? Why do you have to choose? 
<laughs> Por que no es dos? All right, science is happy. One video is happy. You good there, Daryl? We're good. Is that uh, full zoom, is it? can see it a little. Oh, okay. Go wide. I wanted to gross myself out on his little mandibles, but... <laughs> a couple more black corals off in the distance. We don't need to go look at them. I'm pretty sure I know what they are. But if we want to... Get wherever you're going to be most happy, going towards the northwest, and then strike off uphill. Right there. No, uh, you can. Kick you ready? Up. Yeah, kick okay. it back into gear there. Bridge nav. Can we move five zero meters three zero zero, please? Thank you. Oh, I think, oh, spastic manipulator, spastic operator, more like. I'm just going to tuck it in here and hold on to it. So, Chris, I've been wanting to find out a story about Palmyra, and that's the uh, sunken gold buried treasure piracy story. <sighs> That's the story of the Esperanza. I might have to put yes, it away. We yeah. seem to have a DC ground. Can you tell us about that? Uh, sure. I wasn't there, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in 1816, there was a ship called the Esperanza that sailed with a huge loot of ink and gold. Uh, as it was sailing off from Peru, it was attacked by another vessel. And whether it survived or was taken over by the other vessel, no one's really sure, but one of those ships left with all the gold and shipwrecked on Palmyra. And the sailors were able to bury the gold somewhere on Palmyra, supposedly. <laughs> and half of them took off to go try and find help. And the other half stayed on the island. No one's ever been able to find the gold, though, so we look <laughs> And it's it not a day. big island, either. No. Well, there's several islands. They're guessing it was on one of two of them, either home or paradise. I don't think he's on SPL. Okay. Uh, he should be. Oh, I'm just turned way down. Uh, Chris, can you move your mic a little bit closer to your face? Can you hear him? All right, try that. How's that? A little bit better. Okay. So have there been What's treasure your hunters? Called? Real quick, what's your station called? He's okay. on uh, data. All right, I'll increase his voice. Thank you. So have you gone out treasure hunting? Oh, yeah. Uh, my niece asked me to come back with some buried treasure for her. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do find the treasure, in there, don't. what would you do with all the money? Would you national treasure it and just like have a giant vault down below your house? He has to give some of it to his niece. Yeah. Yep, yeah. That's, that'd be her college fund. <laughs> I'd probably sneak a lot of it off. Probably Don't report it in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> some would go to the museum for sure. How's the volume now? I can still barely hear him. I don't know if you guys can. It might just be my settings up here. Uh, I can hear him. So I think this might be a zoanthid overgrowing a dead skeleton. Because if ID in corals isn't hard enough in the deep sea, hmm. you sometimes get these secondary growths over dead corals, and I think that's what we're looking at. This is in some type of zoa zoanthid that has colonized, secondary colonized a dead skeleton. Yeah, that's what I go. That's what I think I want to go with on this one. I can. Uh, and look at the little tiny baby crinoid over here. So cute. Aww. Aww. You can uh, push right in. We're pretty stable there. But full zoom is it? Full zoom. All right. All right. Science is happy. Thank you. Okay. You go wide, please. Thanks. So big picture, we would like to get up to probably the 
depth contour at waypoint five by the end of the dive. So I probably need to stop making so many zoom requests and kind of make a little make a little more tracks. I do that. <clears throat> but I know as soon as I say that, I'm going to see something. Oh, zoom! <laughs> <laughs> so usually how we roll. Yep. And then now. But if if we want to, if you don't mind just kind of flying over any of the corals or sponges you see, I will try and resist the urge to actually ask for zooms. Yeah. I think we've got a pretty good idea of what we're seeing. We just need a good enough view to make sure it's what we've been seeing. Well, we can do uh, we can do flying zooms. I don't have to. I know I did it. I know I said it, but I don't know what that is now. Go ahead, Daryl. Push in there. I'm moving all the time if that makes Perfect. you feel better. This. Is that that astro schema, the brittle snake? Is it is snake star. Snake star. Uh, it is, and I think this could be a paragorgia. Go take there on the uh, polyps one. Yeah, this very might, very Pulls likely in. might be our first paragorgia of the cruise. It's got enough movement to it. I'm pretty sure it's not some type of precious coral. So I will tentatively call that a paragorgia. Um, all right, in the sense of time, okay, let's you keep can go going. Ahead. So that's one of the groups of corals that we do see some patterning here across the Central Pacific of where we see them and where we don't, um, that we're still trying to understand. In the Phoenix Islands, um, on the, on the, on the Tokelau Ridge that goes from Samoa all the way up to Howland, um, you see a real, definitely a pattern of the southern end of the Tokelau Ridge has a fair amount of paragorgia, and by the time you get to the northern end, there's none. Um, one of those mysteries we don't understand yet. And we've only had really two, three um, expeditions along like that thousand miles of seafloor. So we have a very small sampling size, um, but I've been on two of them and two of the three. And you definitely kind of see that pattern of Paragorgia over there. And I'm curious if something similar exists here in the Line Islands. So a viewer said that he wants, or he or she wants to change our watch name from Corley and the Botry Idol Benthix to Science is Happy. Because <laughs> is science really ever happy? <sighs> well, we can be happy and always want more. It's, it's a paradox, but. <laughs> I feel like it's kind of like Larry Meyer, or Mayer, um, always unhappy, but yet he always has a smiley face on. <sighs> Yep, keep moving, please. Is that a dead yeah, sponge? Happy. Or? Yep, I think that's a dead sponge base. And we've got probably another Norella and a, probably a Staropathy's there. Another black coral on the right. You want to chase me up there with your uh, winch? So going back to buried treasure, sunken treasure, I feel like there's so many treasure stories from around my neck of the woods in the Gulf. Um, so growing up, we had a secret lead mine that the Indians kept hidden from all the settlers. And I was like, mm, I live in a small county. I don't know about that. It would have been discovered by now. And then in Corpus, we have a very famous Armada shipwreck that was leaving the port of Corpus, hit a hurricane. And then for, I guess, about 100 years now, every once in a while after a big storm, a gold doubloon will wash up. So. I think it was right before 
It was right before Hurricane Harvey, but right after another major one. And I don't remember the name because I wasn't living down there at the time. Um, I thought it was going to curve around there, but I don't know. The state of Texas changed its treasure laws. So anytime you find a gold Looks to balloon like it now, is. it now belongs to the state of Texas instead of being a finder's thing. That's I silly. Know. I know. It makes finders sense. keepers. That's my thought. It's in there, Darrell. So one of the things as we get on this kind of narrower ridge here, I'll be interested to see is do we see a differentiation in the, um, the location of the animals on one side or the other? Is it more advantageous to be on the northeast side of this feature or the southeast okay, side of this away. feature? And I take it that's because of current flow? That would be my guess. And since we've been coming up the southwest side for the most part and it has been a little devoid, I'm kind of hoping the south, the northeast uh, side of this ridge is going to be a little more um, corally. You think she could uh, change her bearing to the north a bit more? See, see where she says. What is that? That is a brisingid. It's a filter feeding Something sea like star. That, yeah. oh, okay. See my path there is directly north is where the uh, ridge is going. So maybe Darryl, I'll do I baby steps. Maybe she can do 315 or something. Daryl, I know you're from Oklahoma and Tennessee. Do y'all have any good treasure stories over there? I know Missouri's got a really good one. Uh, at the moment, um, I don't remember anything on the top of my mind. Wish there was some cool story. Can, uh, come down a little bit for me there. Good little cluster of black corals coming up here on this next next feature. So here's a good example of a, a little, a little tiny just rise or promontory sticking out in the water, and suddenly you get a cluster of corals on it. Come down another uh, five meters at least. Looks like both what we're calling storopathies uh, and uh, several bathopathies here. the most black coral I've seen like on the last you know hour and a half of this dive than I've seen in a long time they tend to be kind of one-offs uh, in this part of the world or at least over in the Phoenix Islands where I'm, I'm more used to working um, you see them but you don't see them in this kind of density even though it's still pretty sparse uh, this is on the higher end of what I'm used to seeing in black coral density looks like I got a bamboo whip 